Alright, so today we're talking about uh, random sums and graphs, and we're going to see uh, real concentration phenomena for sort of the first time. So, uh, the usual thing, all, the only point I'm really trying to make is we've done a lot, although maybe I should point out, okay, we use things like Markov's inequality, linear expectation, then we use KY's independence, it gets a little more sophisticated, Galton Watson processes, okay. So, so today, right, it's really about this giant component result, which is very interesting. Uh, but the big tool we're going to introduce is what's called a turnoff bound. So let me, let me warm that up. Okay. All right, suppose I flip 100 coins and 50 of them come up heads. Uh, who's surprised? And who's not surprised? Okay, you're not surprised because it's a fair coin, yeah. Yeah, 50% is the average, so you think, oh, 50 is the expectation, although technically it only happens roughly 8% of the time you get exactly 50, so you should be a little surprised. Okay, fine. By contrast, if you flip 100 coins and none come up surprised, uh, who would be, I mean, come up heads, who would be surprised? Yeah, surprised, upset, what's the difference, right? So there's a very small chance of this happening. So you already know this. Okay, here's sort of in-between question. Suppose I flip 100 coins, and at most 25 happens. So, so should you be surprised, right? You know that 25 is less than average, but... I'm allowing 25 or 24, 23 or 22. There's a whole you know, range of possibilities we're allowing for. So the question is, if I'm less, less than equal to 25 come up heads, should you be surprised? Okay. So who would be surprised? I know that's not well defined. And who wouldn't be so surprised? Okay, so still most. Does anyone want to guess what the probability is? Quite low, but just like estimate. Huh? Minus three. So that's like three zeros. Is that in percents or like out of one? Okay. So what is it? I calculated it. So uh, actually there's seven zeros in front of the percent for the percent. So that would be like two more zeros if it was out of one. So actually a very, very small chance of getting at most 25 out of 100. Like, I don't know. I didn't, until I put it in, I didn't actually expect it to be that small. Um, okay, here's another question, sort of similar. I flip 10 coins and at most four of them come up heads, should you be surprised? Okay, so this happens uh, a third of the time, not too surprising. Okay, let me scale it up. Suppose I flip a thousand coins and at most 400 of them come up heads, so it's the exact same ratio as before. Should you be surprised? All right, who wants to guess what the probability might be? All right, neg so, okay, three digits, 10 zeros, three zeros, or five if it's a percent. Okay, uh, turns out to be about. I actually don't know if there's a percent there or not. I kind of. I wrote it once ambiguously a couple years ago, but it, uh, whatever, it's pretty small. Okay. And that's 40%, so that's you know only leaving out 20% of the, the middle. So, so the point of this though is that, is that, is that scale really matters, right? It's, it's really when you go from 10 coins to 1,000, something has radically changed. So, uh, so that's sort of what's called so concentration phenomena. So this is, this is a more general form. So let's say you have n random variables and they're independent. This is almost the most important part. They're independent and they each have uh, like a limited effect on the whole. So they're all bounded between zero and one. You could have kind of scaled and you could do different scales, but here I've scaled to be zero and one. So that could be like a coin toss, tails is zero, heads is one, okay? And I'll let mu denote the average. And what you want to ask is, well, you know that's the average. On average, it's like this. The question is how close is it? to the average, or how often is it very close uh, to the average? 
And, and the answer, I'll give a more precise version, but it's not about the precision. The error probability of deviation is actually exponentially small on the average. So when you're flipping uh, 10 coins and the average is 5, e to the minus 5 not the end of the world. But if you're flipping 1,000 coins and the average is 500, e to the minus 500, now you're really talking. Okay, so it's going to be exponentially small on the average where things are scaled so that each individual variable can only contribute at most one. So there's a, there's a fixed scale. So a more precise form, and this is one of many possible concentration phenomena. So say epsilon's like a 0.01. I'm looking for 1% error. It'll be like e to negative mu over, I guess, 0.01 squared. So that's like 10,000. I mean, that's not very compelling. Let's say epsilon is 0.1, that's 10%. And you'll get like a mu over 100. OK? So, uh, and maybe one thing important is that these are multiplicative guarantees. So I'm looking at error relative to the mean. So that means the bigger the mean, sort of the bigger the margin for error. So maybe that might suggest, oh, the bigger the margin for error, the less likely that we're going to deviate. At some level, the independence is very important. It's sort of saying like, I mean, to go really far from the average, the variables would almost have to like team up, right? And try to get all heads together and all tails together or something to get the average to work out. But if they're independent, it's very hard for things to, to gang up like this. Okay, so for every kind of extra head you get, you'll probably get an extra, well, not, that's not precise, but it may be offset by tails later and so on and so forth. So, so that's, that's the, the thing. Um, if there's time at the end, we'll prove it. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's in the notes or maybe we'll do it in a later class. Um, I have asked students to prove this on the midterm before, uh, which is how I'm going to force you to read it. Okay, um, but I think it's, it's first better to just motivate it at the very least. And so I chose this as a topic where you can see this concentration phenomena, but in a sort of more interesting or more surprising way than just sums of integers, which you've probably been exposed to the central limit theorem before. So it has to do with random graphs. So uh, we're going to be looking at a, a very simple model um, where you have uh, n vertices. And then between every pair of vertices, I'm going to randomly add an edge with some probability p. So it's going to be independent. So every every edge is its own coin toss. OK, so this is like a super duper duper random graph. OK. And so we are going to study this graph and, and ask a sort of qualitatively interesting question. We're going to ask, what does such a graph look like? But of course, it's totally random, right? So you can't like any particular outcome is not very interesting. So when we say, what does this graph look like? You know, there's some kind of random experiment here. And we're going to ask, are there any properties that it like has very consistently, almost certainly? Right. So this itself is already kind of kind of interesting because you're taking something that's radically random and asking if it has anything consistent about it. And yet I couldn't imagine anything more random to begin with. Right. So it's it's a unusual question. So this should be a surprising perspective. OK, so. Here's what we'll prove. We'll actually just do part A today. And part B, I think, will be, be homework. So in this model, where every edge is random, OK, look at the average degree. So p is equal to c over n. And we're looking at either c is bigger than 1 or less than 1. So c is like the average degree in the graph. So it says, if c is any constant bigger than 1, 1.01, 1.11, and you let n get big, then with high probability, there is exactly one connected component in this graph that has a constant fraction of the vertices. Okay, so it'd be some component was like a tenth of all the vertices. And every other component will be really small. Okay, so, so 
So there'll be a g one unique giant component with extremely high certainty. It's probably error going down polynomially in n. So almost certainly your graph is going to look like one giant connected component and maybe some smaller ones. Okay. And and somehow like it's so it's sort of surprising because you have this extremely random graph that's extremely consistent. Random and consistent at the same time. Those two words don't normally come together except in this class. Part two looks at the case when the average degree is less than one. So in general, you would expect the graph to be less connected, but it's quite sharp. So for any constant less than one, then all connected components will have size at most log n. They'll all be small components. Okay. And so this is really strong because it's saying that when you go from average degree 1.00001 to 0.99999, the way the graph looks completely changes. It goes from having no big component to exactly one big component. Okay, so, so anyway, that's this sort of what's called a threshold phenomenon because there's this magical threshold of one. And, and a qualitatively different behavior above and below one. Okay. Um, so this is not, I mean, this is a, a nice model. You know, we're going to be able to do this. Yeah. Yeah, what if C is one? There is an answer to this, but I, I don't remember it. Um, we can look this up in Wikipedia later. Um, so first of all, I should mention that uh, I, I did a constant greater than one and constant less than one because it's a little simpler for us. But people will get even closer and say, okay, what if the average degree is like, um, uh, one plus, uh, log n over n or something. So it gets closer and closer to one as n gets bigger and they'll get even more refined bounds and you'll get roughly this kind of result. So it could be smaller than a constant. It could be something that goes to zero as n gets bigger. Um, but I, I cut it here just because we're just doing introductory level. So I give some pointers to a more detailed uh, analysis. So that's the partial answer. What happens to exactly one? I don't know. Uh, but, but it's actually maybe an interesting philosophical question. At some level, it's very unstable, right? Um, OK. OK, so this is an example of special phenomena, which is not actually that rare. So there are lots of everyday things that behave like this. Does anyone know an example? Sorry? Uh, oh, maybe. Yeah, and that'll kind of come up in this proof. That's sort of like also another random model. How about an everyday example? A transistor? I don't actually know, uh, but maybe we can come back to that. That's true. That's okay. That's literally a threshold function. Well, this might explain why, but I don't fully know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so water really becomes ice exactly at zero degrees. It's not like, oh, once it gets a negative one, it's mostly ice and negative two, it's even more ice. It really switches right away and partly what's happening as i understand i'm not obviously is that the atoms are kind of actually really locking up with each other and so there's some kind of like all for one one for all kind of thing going on where when your neighborhood starts locking up then you're going to lock up more so okay water to ice also water to to gas to vapor is another okay so water is one in general physics there's lots of phase transitions um what's one that's been very relevant for the last five years to five, almost five. Sorry? No, no, not number of parameters for an LLM. That's that's an interesting answer. Maybe, I don't know. But I don't think we know anything about that. Yeah. Yeah, so so um epidemiologists who study diseases, they focus really on this this number of what is the expected number of people that a, a sick person is expected to infect how many other people? So that's that's very close to the average degree. So they have models kind of like this. You know, they might put a lot more bells and whistles in, and a density is going to be different. And you know, I'm not an expert, but these models are in fact very fragile, 
And that's one reason why we're so obsessed with like details and trying to keep this number as low as possible is because a small increase in this average reproductive number uh, could explode in the models. Okay. Uh, a third example is forest fires. So there's actually forest fires going on all the time, but almost all the trees burnt come from one ginormous forest fire. So the distribution of forest fires is just like nothing, 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 nothing boom. Kind of like small component, small component, boom. Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, and then you can find more, of course. Um, but they're all very counterintuitive, right? These are actually all things that sort of as a society, we have a tough time wrapping our heads around. Oh, viral things on social networks, maybe, et cetera. Okay. So how are we going to prove this? We're going to prove it in, in three, I'm going to break it down in three steps. So the first step is where we're going to spend the most time. And that's sort of this, this gap theorem. So our goal is we're going to focus on average degree greater than one and show there's a unique giant component. So the gap theorem says that there's no medium components, which is already kind of bizarre. So it's going to say that every component has size either roughly log n or uh, roughly n. So epsilon here is if the average degree is 1 plus epsilon over n, or if the average degree is 1 plus epsilon, so epsilon is that margin. Okay, then every component is either super small or super big, and there's nothing in between with high probability. So that's where we'll spend most of the effort. That's already quite surprising. Uh, why doesn't this work? Did I actually erase this? Wait. Okay. Well, oh, it froze. No, did it freeze? Oh, it's. Okay. Sorry, the, the pen. Okay. So, okay, we showed, so first we showed there's no medium components. Then we'll show there's at least one really big component. And then the last step will show that there's at most one really big component. So the last thing is the uniqueness of the giant component. So you put that all together, then you'll get there's exactly one giant component. Okay. So, but we'll spend most of our time on part one. Um, and part three, in fact, is, is, is the fastest. So, okay, any question about A, what we're trying to prove and, and B, some of these steps? Because it's a lot to take in. All right, so we'll focus on this gap theorem, this no intermediate component. So I want to show that every component has size log n over epsilon squared, or it's, it's really big. Yeah. And what we'll do is we'll just focus on one vertex first, OK? And for that particular vertex, let's try to argue that its component is either going to be really small or really big but it won't be in between. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so what we're gonna, well, actually, yeah, maybe before I start, does anyone want to suggest any idea of how to approach this? Because I think the eventual thing is quite clever, but I think that's, yeah. 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 So you're describing almost an algorithm that looks like something we've seen before. Yeah, not even, re well, okay. I don't know if this is actually a very good analogy, but it almost feels like you're doing breadth first search or depth first search from V and then maybe go to a vertex and see what vertices come out, you know? So that's what we're going to kind of do is, is you could imagine all the edges are re decided initially, or I can imagine a more iterative process where, okay, first I'm at V, I mark V, and then I'll find out, you know, who are the neighbors of V, right? And I'll go there, and then I'll check off V, I've already visited, 
and I'll go to this vertex and then I'll find out who are the neighbors or something like that. So we're going to do something that's sort of like imagining doing some kind of search like we often do in algorithms class and revealing the edges as late as possible. Somehow this is helpful. So let me, uh, let me pin that down. So here's how we're going to uh, annotate it. So, so there's, there's sort of two sets of vertices to keep track of. One is the vertices that, that we know it's, it's uh, in the connected component that just starts with V. And then there's the vertices where we've checked to see which of its neighbors turned out to be in the graph. So that's what I mean by explore. So in this iterative process A, you'll find out that I can go to this particular vertex. And then later from that vertex, you'll see where else this vertex can go. So there's sort of two stages there. So the first group A is the vertices that are known to be in the connected component. And B is a set of vertices where we've also checked all its edges. We flipped the coins and found out its neighbors. So we'll start with just A is, is only the vertex V, and we haven't explored it yet. And we'll pick some vertex that we know is in a component, but we haven't checked its edges. Then we find out all its neighbors and add it. And, and then we mark it as also explored. Okay, so those are the, the two sets. So V, you'll first find some neighbors, and these are now all in the set A. And then you check it off. This is now in B. Then you go to some vertex here, and then you explore it. You add some neighbors. Maybe it, you'll find another vertex that's already here. And that's when you check it off, add to B, and you keep going. So you're always adding a lot of vertices to A and then adding one vertex to B. Okay. So uh, for the sake of analysis, I'm going to just subscript everything. So A sub I will be A after I iterations. B sub I will be B after I iterations. Be, yeah, and uh, so on and so forth. So V1 is always the initial vertex V. All right, so good. Okay, uh, when does this algorithm terminate? Uh, I guess it's in the code. So it terminates when uh, uh, if and only if uh, oh, actually, maybe we should be more careful. So in the code, it terminates once I've explored all the vertices that I know is in the same component. And then there's nothing else to explore, and, and the game ends. But B, B sub I always has size I, right? Because each vertex I add one. So as I gradually try to simplify this process to find some way to analyze it, we'll make this observation that the algorithm terminates the first time that the vertices that we know are part of the connected component is i, or a sub i has i vertices. That's the same as b sub i eating up all of a sub i. Okay, so that's one simple observation. The second is as follows. So my goal is sort of to try to remove b sub i from the picture. So given A sub I, and you pick some vertex in A and not B, and then you add some neighbors to A, some new neighbors, right? And, and you're really sampling every vertex that's not in A sub I yet independently with probability P, right? So somewhere uh, you have some A sub I right now, and you're, this is your vertex VI that you're exploring. And you know the edges inside don't really matter. Those are already in the connected component. And you're going to sample and find out which vertices from the outside have edges, right? And this sample we can call SI plus one. Okay. So the one thing kind of nice about this is that we're starting to rewrite our our search algorithm in a way that has nothing to do with B sub I. The termination condition is just based on A sub I, and also this kind of iterative what happens next iteration is just based on A sub I. So, so we can start rewriting 
uh, the code, the, the previous one is on the left. And on the right, now the terminating condition just depends on the size of AI. And we'll just randomly sample to try to add to AI. So that's independent sample. And then I'll, I'll add to AI. Okay. Um, so this is the, this is the exact same thing. If we analyze this, we'll still understand this. But we sort of reduce the number of moving parts. And I think in hindsight, it'll be clear. Oh, okay. This is a very convenient way of looking at it. Um, yeah, it's not obvious, uh, even if it's cleaner in hindsight. Okay. So that's, uh, that's our algorithm. So, okay. So at some level, we want to argue that if I'm just looking at a sub i and its cardinality, the claim is that we never have intermediate components. So we want to argue that a sub i is never equal to i for any of those intermediate values of i. Okay. And in fact, I think we're going to try to argue that it should be bigger. So let me first do something. Is okay. So for the sake of analysis, I could imagine just continuing to run this algorithm without the terminating condition. Okay, for the sake of analysis, I can imagine running this algorithm uh, anyway, even if it did terminate, and still ask myself, oh, what are the odds that A sub 100 is less than equal to 100? or has less than equal to 100 vertices, as if I hadn't terminated earlier. And that'll make it a little bit easier because then we don't have to worry about previous events as much. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna imagine that there's no terminating condition and then just analyze A sub I, and then we'll bring everything back in at the end. And so what I wanna argue is that when I is pretty big, like bigger than log n or so, um, that AI has more than I vertices in it. So if I can argue that AI always has more than I vertices and the algorithm never ends. So what we'll do is we'll try to focus on one I at a time, show that it will have more than I vertices is really high probability, and then we can take a union bound. Okay. So as a starting point, let's look at its average. So imagine I is moderately big, and let's ask, what is the expected number of vertices in AI after I rounds? Where again, each round, I'm just sampling more vertices, more vertices, more vertices, and throwing it into A. Okay. All right, so the first question is always, what's the average? How can we try to do this? Yeah. Expected value. Is that what you asked? What's E? Oh, P is 1 plus epsilon N. That's the probability of an edge being sampled. Epsilon is some fixed value greater than 0. So just go all the way back. Every single edge in the graph is sampled with probability P. You mean uh, select that neighbor? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, I think uh, I'm I'm going a little bit swiftly swiftly through it, but yeah, we shouldn't lose appreciation of how do we even analyze this thing to begin with. But right now, what we've done is we've taken an approach where we really try to imagine that I'm doing some kind of search algorithm, where in the tenth iteration or in the first iteration, I'm at v. And then I look at all the neighbors of V. So only when I'm kind of searching V in a BFS, DFS sense, and I mark V, 
I look at all of these edges once and for all. No, so SI is all the elements, or S1 would be all the neighbors of V, which then get added into our pile A. A is, is everyone we know at, at, a, at a point in time that's connected to V originally. So it's all of those S's thrown in. S is one round of sampling, but it's really looking at one vertex and saying, what are the neighbors? Yeah, so the setup is actually really important. Um, okay, so, so AI is this process where each round, you know, which under the hood is looking at some vertex and all the neighbors, but I can just, all I have to worry about is, oh, you just sample some neighbors and add it to A. I sort of uh, abstracted out B to make it a little bit easier to think about and analyze. So, uh, right, how can I try to analyze the expected value of AI? We can start with, we know that like A0, you know, A0 is always equal to one, right? Because it's just V. So what would be the expected value of A1? Uh, yeah, I guess there's the one plus. It's not really a big deal. N minus one times P, right? So every other vertex has probability P of being put in, and we can use linear of expectation. Okay. What is A2? I'll put the one plus here. What's double expectation? Uh, you could. Uh, well, first of all, this is not necessarily true. So it is not true. Like this kind of thing, which would work for probabilities. Like, you know, multiplying these averages together or something. Oh, okay. Okay, iterated. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's iterated expectations or something. Oh, sure. Okay, so I think it's like one plus n minus n minus one. Uh, like this. Okay, then what's this? I think this is complicated, even if my handwriting didn't suck. Okay, I know what, I know that, that's the line before. But what does this simplify to? There's a shortcut to calculating it. Here, this is, I'll let you guys tell me why this is the answer. Okay, you did it carefully. I guarantee this is the right answer, but why? What does this term represent? So this is the n minus one other vertices.
Yeah, so Vertex is not in our set if in the, each of the first two rounds it failed. So it fails with probability 1 minus p squared, and then 1 minus that. That's a little easier. So, so in general, I'm going to erase all this. Okay, so in general, how would I do this for i? Just change the two, okay. Uh, one plus, that's not really a big deal. Uh, one minus one minus p to the i times n minus one. Okay. And now what is this roughly? So we want to show this is bigger than something. Now, if I look at 1 minus p to the i, huh? Yeah, you can do 1 minus i p. Oh, no, that would be the other direction. Wait, let's do this slowly. So whenever you have 1 minus p or 1 minus x, uh, so Remember, e to the x is really, really close to 1 plus x for small x. So in general, 1, 1 plus x, even for negative x, is always at most e to the x. Okay, so I'm going to apply that first, e to the negative pi. Okay. And actually, so if you look at e to the x is equal to 1 plus x plus x2 over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so forth, you know, these, if x is a relatively small number, like less than 1, then these terms are really small, right? Because you're taking a 1 half and cubing it and taking it to the fourth, plus you have this factorial term. So in fact, if, for example, x is less than or equal to 1, this is at most 1 plus x plus x squared for, I think, it doesn't really matter. Maybe x is at most ln 2 or something. Every once in a while, I'll calculate exactly. But certainly for x less than or equal to 1. Okay. It's because those smaller terms don't add up. So this is going to be at most uh, 1 minus pi plus pi squared. Okay. And here, if I look at these two terms, so pi is equal to 1 plus epsilon over n times epsilon n over 4. So uh, here we I have this condition that i is at most epsilon n over 4. Then what do we get? We get something like uh, the n's will cancel out. And you'll get like, okay, between friends, roughly epsilon over 4. Okay, I'll just put it there. Epsilon plus epsilon squared over 4. Okay. This, sounds, this looks like a little technical, but you're going to do this like a million times. And it won't be so intimidating with some practice. Uh, so you get uh, 1 minus pi plus epsilon plus epsilon squared over 4 pi. And if epsilon's like at most 1 or 1 half or something, this should be like 1 minus, I don't know, epsilon over 2 or maybe epsilon over 4 just to be safe. Pi. Okay. Uh, where were we? So... Um, I should use colors better. Something around here, this should be at least, so this is off by some factor, 1 plus epsilon over 4 i. I know it might seem annoying that I'm just throwing constants around, but that's sort of what we do. Uh, I should, it should have been epsilon over 4 originally. You lost a little bit. Um, but what it's sort of saying is that, you know, so on average, right, because it's uh, 1 plus epsilon, on average, you're getting 1 plus epsilon neighbors if there's n vertices originally, you know. So if you imagine in the first round, right, you have n minus 1 neighbors to choose from, and then on average, you'll get 1 plus epsilon, yeah, times n over n, n minus 1 over n or something, but that's kind of negligible. So you're getting about 1 plus epsilon. So you're getting slightly more than 1 on average. So you do actually expect... AI to be close to 1 plus epsilon I, because you're kind of getting 1 plus epsilon on average, 
Except once i starts to get a little bit bigger, like closer to epsilon n over four, there's fewer to sample from, and that's why the average goes down a little. Okay, so uh, it's a little messy, but but we end up doing this one plus x is less than equal to e to the x, and then flipping back all the time. And what's going down going on is that x is so small, you're not losing much from these inequalities. Okay, so all right, that's the that's the average. Here's maybe a more interesting thing. So I want to argue that the odds of i being smaller than the average. Uh, yeah, okay. I was just being lazy, but let's say the average is 1 plus epsilon. Okay, I can put a 4 there. It's not a big deal. Um, uh, you know, so... For AI to be less than or equal to I, it has to be like epsilon over four smaller than the average or so. And the claim is it should be exponentially small in I. Okay. The eight might change, but roughly eight. Okay. All right. So how, so this is the concentration thing, right? It's saying, oh, the odds of being less than I is exponentially small in I. So, why? Yeah. We can try to use this turnoff bound. Okay, so this is where we're going to apply concentration phenomena. We have to look at it in a very clever sideways way. But now we can try to apply this concentration phenomenon. The odds of it deviating from the average is exponentially small in the average. No, they don't need to be identically distributed, but they need to be independent. And we need to figure out what the XIs are. So this concentration phenomenon only holds if it's modeled as a sum of independent random variables with value between 0 and 1. So we can't apply it unless we figure out what that is. So that's my next question. If I wanted to apply the turnoff bound, what would be my xi's? It could be the change in AI, right? Uh, how many things I add each round. But there's a there's there's at least it doesn't quite fit that form, but where? Not between zero and one. It's possible with something fancy or you can push that through, but for the sake of this discussion, it's it's not between zero and one. So we want to think of a zero one model. Yeah, whether or not a particular vertex is an AI. Remember, we're looking at this simplified process where for each round I just try to add more vertices, try to add more vertices. So actually whether one vertex is in it has nothing to do with any other vertex being in it. So it is independent. So if xi, uh, I'll use j, if xj is equal to 1, if jth vertex in ai and 0 otherwise, and there's n vertices, then size of ai is equal to the sum of xj's, and the xj's are between 0 and 1, and they're independent. Okay, so this is this is very subtle, but you are in fact able to recognize the size of AI as a sum of independent random variables, and it's not the obvious choice of the increments from each round. So now, if we apply this, and you say, okay, what are the odds that AI? So when we say AI is bigger than I or something, we're really saying it's like you know, at most uh, 1 over 1 plus epsilon over 4, uh, it's expectation. Right, because it's, it's expectation is 1 plus epsilon over 4 times i. And we're asking if, what's it less than equal to i. And this is a little bit annoying because above we had some 1 minus epsilon, and this is like a 1 over 1 plus epsilon kind of thing. But that's actually not that big a deal. So... 
in general, I'm always so lazy. When x is really small, this is really close to 1 plus x. So I just know if x is small enough and I put a 2 there, it's definitely fine. Because at the limit, as it goes to 0, it's exact, right? So that means for sufficiently close to 0, it's within a factor 2. It's not a big deal. Okay. So, so I'll say like, oh, this is uh, less than equal to the probability that size of AI uh, is less than equal to 1 minus epsilon over 8 is expected value. Uh, let me just write mu. Since we, that will plug in. This will be minus. Uh, yeah, I guess you just do whatever you want. So if you wanted the greater than or equal to, then you just do divided by two. You just, you know, you just pay pessimistically by a factor. And then you can work it out slowly, right? You just have to multiply the terms and you'll see that one side is greater than or equal to one or something, or less than or equal to one. And then, uh, so this is at most mu. So then you'll get e to the negative uh, epsilon squared becomes epsilon squared over 64. And there's another factor of two times mu. So, you know, I wasn't too careful about the constants. So I got 128 instead of the desired factor of eight, but it's okay because we're friends in this room. And, and, and what's really going on is that it's exponentially small in the average. And, you know, we could go back and sharpen up the constants, but you would like me even less than you already do. So uh, that's really the key point. Okay. So the real thing is we, we recognize, right. So, so that's, that's, that, yeah. Well, you have to kind of like stare at it and convince yourself. So we're looking at this particular version, rewritten version, where each round you have some current set A, and then you try to add some vertices, right? Each vertex, each other vertex could be added with probability P, kind of regardless of what's currently in A. I feel like the answer to that question is no. Like, I, I, yeah, somehow like saying, can we just rename things seems like a slippery slope. Um, Cause it like, when can you not? Um, so, so a real key thing is this is slightly different than the original process, which felt more like BFS, you look at one vertex. So it was only after we abstracted out BI from this perspective, the vertices are independent. So whether a vertex gets added in the 10th round, a particular vertex gets added in the 10th round, is independent of who was already added in the ninth round, regardless of what happened in the ninth round. As long as it's not in it already, it has some. So ultimately, the chance of a vertex being sampled has nothing to do with anyone else being sampled. It just has to not have an edge sample for all 100 rounds or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we've actually, remember, I, I, I removed the, oh. We are analyzing under AI, assuming we just removed the termination condition entirely. And I'm just saying, oh, imagine every round I add more edges. I just see if I add, see if I add, see if I add. And so it's not so dependent on the past. So if you remove the termination condition, you can just as a thought experiment analyze what would happen if you had kept the algorithm running even when one round didn't explore anybody new. So, Okay, I, I need to speed run this. Um, so what's nice is that, so this is really small. And so as soon as you're like bigger than log n over epsilon squared, 32, if that was the case for that constant, then you're getting like a probability one over n to the fourth. Okay. And that lets you take a union bound over all values of i um, uh, between like log n and roughly n. Okay, so once you get the log n, that average is big enough that the concentration really kicks in. Okay, so if if AI is never less than I for all of these values in between, then you'll never generate that medium-sized component because I it would have to be equal to I to generate a medium-sized component. Okay, 
So that's that's how you get the, the gap theorem. And what I'll do is I'll quickly explain the last two. Okay. So, so to argue that there's a giant component, we argue that all the components are small or big. Now, if you look at a vertex and you can just survive 32 log n rounds, then you're promised that you're not going to lose after that. So you just have to survive 32 log n rounds, right? Now, each round, you're adding some neighbors, and you kind of on average expect to survive, right? Because the average degree is a little bit bigger than one. So this actually turns out to be a Galton-Watson process like last time. Last time we did binary trees, okay? But this is more like on the first round, you have n possible children, each of which gets sampled is probably slightly bigger than one over n. Okay, so now it's k instead of just two. But you get the exact same theorem, as long as the expectation is at least uh, one then you have probably at least the height. If you're trying to survive 10 generations, at least one over 10. You're trying to survive log n generation, it's at least one over log n, okay? So a particular vertex has probability at least one over log n of surviving that beginning dangerous part. And once it survives the beginning part, it wins. It gets to the giant component, okay? So that's that, and there's n vertices, so one of them will survive. Last one. How do I argue it's unique? This one, it can be done by picture very quickly. So we've now shown that there's at least one giant component. Yeah, no medium components, okay? Now I wanna show there's exactly one, no more than one, okay? How do we do this? This is kind of a trick proof. Imagine dividing your two vertex sets in half, okay? And do sample those edges first. And you know you're going to have some giant components, right? We don't know yet that there's only at most one. I'm not assuming that. But this has like epsilon squared n edges, and this has or epsilon squared n vertices. Okay. If I look at two of these, one giant component from each one, and how many possible edges there are in between, there's epsilon to the fourth n squared possible pairs with one giant component and the other. And each, each pair is going to occur with probability 1 over n. So an expectation, on average, you're going to get something like epsilon fourth times n edges, where epsilon is just a constant, right? So you're expecting like n edges between any two components. Right? So you're definitely going to get at least one. That's like for Markov's, I mean, if we apply that same concentration from before, it's going to be like e to the minus n or something now. Like, yeah, I mean... Yeah, so you're definitely going to get um, uh, at least one between every pair of giant components on one side and the other. So this will be connected across the middle. And if you connect everything, and I don't know if I did, um, something like this, now you have one giant component overall. Okay, so this last step actually was not so bad. So those are the, the three steps. We didn't do this proof. That's okay. Um, and, and yeah, so that that's then a, a, this graph is an example of concentration phenomena where you see concentration of numbers translating into combinatorial concentration, which is pretty amazing. Okay, thank you.